What's up guys, Matt Day here, and today I'm going to be reviewing the Yashica Mat 124G. As you guys know, I picked up this camera about a month ago from eBay, and I paid $200 for this one, which is in perfect condition. Uh, if you're not looking for something in that good a condition, you could easily spend a lot less money and still get a perfectly functioning camera. And for the money, this thing is absolutely great. I've been blown away. I've probably put at least a couple dozen rolls of film through it uh, over just the last month, um, if not more. So I've been really, really enjoying it, but I don't really have much time to waste today. Uh, Nora is having a particularly rough day today and Molly works tonight so she really needs to get a nap in before she goes in so uh, I'm gonna try and make this quick so with that being said we'll go ahead and take a closer look at the camera okay so we got the Yashica Mat 124G here and just some basic information about the camera it's a 6x6 TLR if you guys didn't already know that and it accepts 120 or 220 film and this is the uh, lens cap here it's just a little rubber lens cap that sits on the front lens there um, but it's a TLR, meaning a twin lens reflex. So you're viewing through this lens right here and you're actually using this lens to take the photo. So that's what a twin lens reflex is. Um, the lens is an 80 millimeter F3.5 Yashinon lens. Um, it's a really, really nice lens. Um, a lot sharper than I was expecting, honestly. A lot of people, especially if they're used to shooting with a Roloflex or things like that, they're usually not too keen on this kind of lens, but I've had great results from it and I'll show you guys those later. Uh, the lens was made from 1970 to, or I'm sorry, the camera itself was made from 1970 to 1986. So it was a really successful camera um, and it was in production for that long um, and for good reason. You know, it's, it's a great camera and we're going to talk more about that later and show you some results. But uh, the lens itself, it's a four element lens. Uh, the bayonet mount on the front, it's a bay one mount so you can add uh, bay one accessories and I have some of those over here and I'll show you those here in a minute as well. Um, as for the camera though, we'll kind of just walk around the camera. This is your waist level viewfinder up here. You pop that up and uh, there's your ground glass in there. Now right off the bat, I am gonna say I upgraded the ground glass in here. Uh, it came with a, a pretty standard ground glass, but honestly, my first impressions, it looked nice, but then once I really started using it and comparing it to other waist level finders, um, I realized that the focusing screen in there was actually pretty dim, uh, a lot more dim than I realized at first. So what I did was I looked online to see what kind of ground glass I could put in here. And I found a website from a guy named Rick Olson. And Rick makes ground glass for all kinds of different cameras, including the Yashica uh, TLRs. And I got a new ground glass put in for $35 only, which is incredible because a lot of other cameras, if you replace the focusing screen in there, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, for instance, the one I have in my Hasselblad cost $300, whereas this one was $35. Uh, so I thought, even if it doesn't make a big difference, you know, it's worth to try it out, and it made a huge difference. Uh, it's much easier to focus now, and on top of that, he actually has a split prism in there. I don't know if you can really see it, but right there in the center that's kind of lit up right now with that highlight, uh, that's a split prism. So it's similar to, uh, you know, any other 35 millimeter SLR that has it. You know, you're going to see the image right in the center and it will split. And, you know, whenever it lines up perfectly, that's when you know you're in focus. So it's really, really handy for checking uh, critical focus. And uh, I think it makes a big difference. And for $35, you know, it's sort of a no-brainer. So if anybody is interested, I'm going to put a link in the description for that website. And you can pick one up your, as well. Um, I had the rule of thirds grid. Uh, put on mine, you can choose all different kinds of grids that you want to have put on the ground glass. So really, really nice feature. Um, aside from that though, your viewfinder, you also have your uh, magnifier right here. You just push in on this front window and that pops up. Um, another kind of interesting thing is if you push this all the way back, it locks into place and you can see now the front, you would actually just be looking through this little window right here and this is like your sports finder. So um, I actually never used this, but I know back in the day some people would for say sports or uh, you know landscape photos where you don't really have to worry about focus. But honestly, um, part of the enjoyment I think of using these cameras is using that waist level finder. Um, and yeah, like you could see just to uh, release that, there's this little tab back here. Just push in on it and it basically pops it back up. So to uh, close the viewfinder, you just push that down fold that down and you're good to go. Now right on top of the camera here you can see this little dial uh, over here on this side and then this little window and it says ASA. So this is how you're going to control the light meter in this camera. So the light meter itself, it is powered by a battery and I'll get to that here in a minute. 
but you control this little dial here to select your ASA speed or your film speed. And it goes up to 400, so um, you know, obviously if you're shooting uh, film faster than that or pushing your film, you can't set the meter to it, but it's pretty simple. I mean, if I'm shooting 1600, I'm gonna set it to 400, get my measurement, and then basically just go up two stops. So it's, it's really, really simple. Um, you know, it's easy to work around that. But you'll notice this needle right here and this little, uh, kind of like a little picker arm, um, whenever you open the viewfinder, that's what actually engages the light meter. So whenever the uh, light, or the, I'm sorry, when you open up the viewfinder, it engages the needle here, and whenever you close it, that's when it turns off the light meter. So if your camera is stored like this, it's not going to be running down the battery because your viewfinder is closed, and that's disengaging your light meter. Um, over here on this side, you have your uh, cold shoe mount, so if you want to mount a flash or anything, I actually mounted a GoPro to the camera, and we'll get to that here in a little bit. But you can mount your accessory right there, which is mostly a flash. Um, and also you have your uh, two knobs right here. This has to do with loading your film and you have your focusing knob right here. So you can see you have your focusing scale on the side and uh, that's going to give you sort of like your, uh, your depth of field scale. So you're going to know how much depth of field you have given uh, you know, your, where you're focusing at and also given your aperture. We have uh, our strap mounts right here. This is a think tank strap. I can't tell you exactly what it is because I don't remember. I'll put a link in the description. I bought mine from B&H. Um, it just looked like it would be a comfortable strap and it has these little rubber kind of grooves on it and that helps kind of grip onto your shoulder. Uh, really nice strap though. I ended up cutting mine and super gluing the ends so they weren't hanging over all the time just because it was a little long in my opinion, but you know, it's a nice strap. Um, over here on this side, this is where you have your uh, film advance. You have this lever right here and then you fold it back down and you can shoot that way. So you fold it up and then it just kind of sits in this little pocket down here once you fold it down and then you, uh, you know, release the shutter right here on the front. Right here on the side you can see where it says 12 exposures and up here you have your frame counter window. So it'll let you know exactly what frame you're on. But this little window that says 12 exposures, that'll actually change to 24 exposures if we open up the back and slide the pressure plate. And I'll show you that here in a minute. So that's what's gonna remind you whether you're shooting 120 film or 220 film. And if it's selected to 220, this uh, frame counter right here isn't gonna stop at 12, obviously. It's gonna go all the way to 24. So on the bottom of the camera, you have uh, just these little feet right here. So that way, whenever you set it down, that's what's making contact. Um, nothing on the back of the camera, but this is where you load the film. So on the bottom, you can see you've got this little wheel here outside of your tripod mount, and it has a C with an arrow and an O with an arrow for close or open. So all you have to do is rotate it towards the, Z the O, and uh, that opens up the back, and now you can lift it open. And this is where you're going to be loading your film. Now, like I mentioned a second ago, this is your pressure plate. So if you push this down and slide it this way, it's now on uh, 24 exposures for shooting uh, 220 film. So if you push it down and then slide it this way, now it's the proper pressure for uh, 120 film where you're gonna get 12 exposures. So that's how you uh, change that back and forth. And as you can see, when we switch it to 24, over here on this side, it now has a little 24 in that window instead of a 12. So just to be safe though, I, don't I rarely ever shoot 220 just because it's not really in production as much anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that back to 120. Um, but to load your film, it's really simple. We'll go ahead and load a roll of HP5 in here. And uh, once you get done with the roll, it's gonna be sitting down here and then you'll take it out and load it up here in the top. But I've already done that. I tend to do that pretty much automatically and just out of habit. Um, but we'll go ahead and open this. This little tab right here, you can see this uh, slide out. I pull this out and then I give it a twist so it stays in place and we'll load up our film. So to load this, you just put this roll right here in the bottom, and then with this, we can turn it so that it is unlocked right there. So now the film is locked into place, so we're gonna go ahead and pull this up, and maybe, is this, okay, now it's locked. Um, so we'll pull this up and this will go right into this little film uh, spool up here. And I'm going to rotate that just so I can get to the little slit. And now I kind of just keep my thumb right here and keep pressure on it. So that way it's going to be, you know, winding tight and not really loose on this spool. So now that we know it's in there, we'll go ahead and start winding. 
And right here you have little arrows for 24 exposures. So that's where your start, mil start mark should be. But on 120 film, it's hard to see, but it's kind of back here. Excuse me, my wife just sent me a uh, photo of our daughter per usual. Let me silence that for now. Right here on this side, like I said, it's hard to see, but you have a little arrow right here, and that's where you're gonna stop for 120 film. It's hard to see in this video, but just so you know, that's where it's at. It's easier to see in person. So go ahead and wind it until right about there. You can't see the arrow, but that's about the area you wanna stop at. So now that we've done that, we go ahead and push this back down and turn this to close. And you can see this little tab right here will actually drop down and it locks in with this little pin underneath here. And that's what's actually gonna hold it into place. So that's how you load the film. And then right here, you just advance this all the way until you're at one. And then you bring this back, fold it down and you're ready to shoot. Now on the front here, uh, this is where your, uh, your shutter release is and it is threaded. So if you wanna have a, a cable for long exposures, you can do that or if you wanna attach a soft shutter button, I usually do that as well. Uh, but there's a lock right here. So you swivel this to the L where the red L is and the red line, and now it's locked. So I'm not gonna accidentally be getting any exposures, which is a really, really nice feature. Now let's talk more about the lens and just shooting in general. Um, up here on top of the camera, it's a little hard to see, but right here you have two little windows. So you have one for your seconds and one for your uh, f-stop. So you control your aperture with one, which would be this side over here. And basically you can just rotate this little dial with this thumb to control your aperture. So you go from f3.5 all the way to f32. So you can stop this lens down quite a bit. And then from there, we can control the shutter speed over here on this side. So you can go from 1 500th of a second, which is the maximum shutter speed, all the way down to one second or bulb where the B light, uh, shows up right here. So that's how that works. Uh, you control your aperture and shutter speed with these two little thumb wheels. I really like that just because it's so minimal. Uh, it stays, it's, you know, it's out of the way, but it's comfortable whenever you're holding the camera like this. Um, over here, you also, you have your uh, sync port right here if you are using a flash. And down here, you actually have your frame counter, or I'm sorry, your frame counter, your uh, self timer. I don't know why I said frame counter. You have your self timer right here, so you bring this back, and then whenever you uh, release the shutter, this little thing will slide all the way back over, and that's gonna be your self timer. Uh, works pretty much just like any other self timer. Um, the last thing I do wanna talk about uh, on the camera itself is the battery port, which is right here. This only powers the meter, so if you don't have a battery in it, it's still 100% functional. It's just uh, you're going to be without a meter. Now, these use uh, some kind of zinc air batteries or mercury batteries back in the day. Um, I picked up this battery from the local hardware store. It's just one of these little uh, weird kind of cell batteries. This is a Energizer EPX C2 5G. Um, I don't know anything about the, the battery itself or what kind of batteries uh, you know work and don't work. I just Googled and uh, did some research. I saw that this one uh, kind of worked. It was a little bit off, but you could compensate for that. So I picked one up for a couple bucks and uh, the meter works. It's usually reading at about a stop underexposed. I just did some tests with my Sekonic meter and uh, in some various kind of lighting and it's pretty consistently just a stop underexposed. So all I do is uh, if I'm not using a meter, I will just meter with this and then whatever it reads, I'll go ahead and increase the exposure by one stop and that compensates for it. So it's really, really simple. Uh, your meter is right here that you can see on the front right by the logo. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really simple to compensate for that. So it's not a big deal. 99% of the time I am gonna have my Sekonic in there uh, or in the bag with me. So I'm gonna be using it. But if I'm ever without my meter and I wanna grab a photo really quick, it's nice to have this. It doesn't hurt to have it there. You know, it's, it's nice to have just in case. So that's pretty much it for the camera itself. I do have some other uh, accessories here that I'm gonna talk about. This is just a little plastic lens hood. Uh, this lens is known to flare uh, quite easily whenever you're shooting in sunlight. So it's just a little plastic lens hood I picked up on eBay for like $6. Uh, you just mount it on the front and then give it a twist and it kind of locks into place just like that. 
I like the way the camera looks and it's gonna keep me from uh, having any flare and it's a little bit of extra protection from the front lens there. So uh, yeah, it's nice to have. So that's just a quick little accessory that I picked up uh, and I pretty much leave it on at all times. Um, but also I have a couple other things here. I have some close-up filters. So this is a, well first I'll talk about this one. This is a Yashica plus one filter and this is great for portraits. I've found this to be the perfect length for shooting portraits. Um, I shot some photos of my dad on his 78th birthday uh, just a couple of weeks ago and you'll see some photos from that later. They're the really close up portraits of him uh, when he's smoking his pipe. And uh, I shot them with this close up filter and it let me get just the right distance. So uh, it, it comes in two little parts here. You have a tall and a short uh, filter. The tall one, this goes on your taking lens. So let me, there we go, lock that into place. And then the, this one goes on the bottom and it even says taking lens on the bottom there. So you know which, which one goes where. And uh, this lets you get a lot closer. So that's really, really nice because although, uh, you know, it takes an extra step to put these filters on if you wanna shoot something close up, it's worth it. These things take up no space at all in your camera bag um, and you can find them for, you know, relatively cheap as well. I paid like 20 to $25 for this one from another photographer and uh, this one I think I paid $20. This is actually a Roland R3 filter. So this was a plus one, this is a plus three, and this is actually uh, not a Yashica version, it's the Roly version, but they're all Bay 1 filters. They all work with this bayonet mount. So works the same way. Uh, you put the uh, long one up here on the top on the viewing lens and then the bottom one on the taking lens and that's it. Now this one you get like extremely, extremely close. And uh, I'll put a photo up of some flowers that I took. Uh, I took a photo of some flowers with this thing and it's insane how close you can get with this. So this is uh, a little bit more specific use, but the close-up filters, uh, the plus one close-up filter, I could probably shoot with that thing all day just because it's, it's a really nice distance, especially when shooting portraits. So these are just a couple things I've picked up for the camera. Um, like I said, 20, 25 bucks for each of these and uh, I think they're worth it to have in the bag. If you're gonna be shooting with this camera, they're great accessories to have. So that's pretty much it on an overview of the camera itself. Um, it's a really, really simple camera. I've probably talked way more than needed to, but uh, what matters more than anything is actually getting out and shooting. So what we're gonna do is go for a walk with Molly and Nora and uh, see what we can come up with. So I hope you guys enjoyed that montage I put together from our walk downtown. And they're not the most groundbreaking photos, obviously, but I thought it would be a fun challenge to just go for a walk with the camera with one roll of film and see what I could find. So that's what I came up with over about an hour or so of walking, but now we'll go ahead and take a look at some of my favorite photos I've made with this camera. <laughs> Thank you. 
right, so there you guys have it. You guys have seen my favorite photos that I've made with the Yashica mat ever since I bought it. And like I mentioned earlier, I've probably put over a couple dozen rolls of film through this camera and I'm really, really enjoying it and I love the results I'm getting out of it. I've only shot black and white film through it. I haven't put any color negative film through there, but I'd like to at some point because this lens does have a really unique kind of characteristic to it and I'd be anxious to see what kind of results I can get putting some color negative through there. So uh, hopefully I can shoot some of that soon. But just from what I've shot so far, I've absolutely been blown away by this thing. Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I paid $200 for this camera for a mint condition one. And you know, you could easily get this camera in perfect working condition for much cheaper if you're not looking for something that is, you know, actually perfect uh, cosmetically. So it's a great camera, especially for the money. You know, in the past I owned a Mamiya C330 and I had a lot of fun with that camera. But uh, even though you had, you know, interchangeable lenses, you had an 80 millimeter f2.8 lens, uh, you had bellows focusing so you could get extremely close right out of the box. Uh, it was a nice camera, but it was such a big camera, uh, like a lot of Mamiya cameras. Uh, I just, this is a completely different experience. You know, having a camera that's much smaller, having a fixed lens so you don't have any other options, you're just working with that 80 millimeter lens. Uh, even despite not having glass as fast as you would with the Mamiya, I still would choose this over the Mamiya any day of the week just because it provides a different kind of experience. And uh, due to the size, I'm using it all the time. You know, I'm always taking it with me. So having a lot of fun with the camera and I would definitely, definitely recommend it. So if you guys are interested in picking one of these up, like I said, I got mine off of eBay. You can probably find them there on KEH, on, uh, you know, film gear groups, on Facebook. Uh, you can find them all over the place. So definitely check one out if you're interested. I would definitely recommend it. So if you guys have any questions at all about the Yashica mat, please leave those below in the comments. Or if you have any other comments about the camera or the other Yashica TLRs, uh, there's a lot to choose from, not just the Mat 124G. There are tons of them out there. So if you have any comments for, you know, other uh, subscribers here as well, definitely leave those below in the comments. And uh, if you guys like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff coming up this month. Also, don't forget, I'm gonna be announcing the winner of the 10K Celebration Contest at the end of the month. I'm really excited about that. I've seen some incredible work so far, so I'm really looking forward to picking the winner. But that's it for today, so I wanna thank you guys, as always, for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.